Hello, everyone. It's supposed to be 20 minutes. Um, welcome to the first in five conversations taking place online as part of this week's closing week. Uh, my name is Shema Ayoub. I'm a photographer and image maker, and also your guest host for these online conversations where I have the absolute uh, honor and privilege of speaking to five incredible people doing really important cultural work within the realm of photography. Uh, joining me this evening is the founder and director of Women's Alternative Photography Group, Elizabeth Ransom. Uh, Elizabeth is also the co-author of the recently published Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, Changes in Policy and Practice report from Fast Forward Women in Photography. Uh, she is a PhD candidate at the University for the Creative Arts, uh, researching the impact of migration on women alternative photographers. Uh, Elizabeth is also an adjunct professor at Western Washington University in the Art and Art History Department and runs workshops at the Photographic Centre Northwest in Seattle and the Shack Art Centre in Everett. Uh, and is also an artist, obviously, um, taking from her own lived experiences of migration to explore homesickness and transnationality. Hello, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to share my work with everyone. So I'm very excited. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for joining us this evening um, to talk about your practice. We've um, known of one another um, thanks to the first edition of uh, Oswe through the Fast Forward Workshop. But I really got to know your work on Instagram like after following you on Instagram. And I'm just fascinated by the alternative photography process and and achieving imagery through through various means, something that you do really, really well. Um, I was never really like massively exposed to like for example, like cyanotype printing, but I've gotten to know more about it through you and through the work of uh, we have an artist who's uh, work is in today this year, Michelle Hijazi, um, where she's done some workshops on cyanotype and um, does that work as well. Um, so I've been admiring two projects um, that you'll be talking about this evening um, that touch on migration and memory. And I think a lot of people will relate to these projects. So um, I know you've got a presentation. <laughs> so um, if you could uh, present and then we can discuss um, and then hopefully we have some questions at the end. So for those of you joining us, please make use of the chat function. Um, if you have any questions, pop them in the box below and we'll get to them at the end. So Elizabeth, please take it away. All right. Can you see that okay? Yeah. All good. Yep. Perfect. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ransom, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am going to be talking about two bodies of work today, uh, one that is incredibly personal and comes from uh, my own lived experience of migration, and then one that is looking outwards uh, using the experiences of other migrant women. Uh, so it's going to be sort of obviously very um, personal and very uh, it, coming from a place of uh, like emotion, uh, but also sort of looking at and sort of trying to find, you know, what is it that being a transnational artist is? What does it mean to be a migrant woman? What does it mean to look at migration from uh, a, like an individual perspective? Uh, what is it those, um, you know, th those emotions and those like the feeling homesick and the not feeling like you belong and that kind of duality. So these projects are not looking at migration from like a political perspective, you know, it's much more the lived experience of migration. Uh, so I was born in England, uh, in uh, sort of the south of England, about a couple hours away from London. And uh, I grew up there until I was nine years old. And then uh, my dad got a job in America and we moved over to the States. And it was a, a really uh, you know, challenging time uh, for a child to sort of be plucked out of their everyday life and moved all the way to the other side of the, the world to, um, you know, like not knowing when you're going to see your family again, not knowing when you're going to like hang out with your friends. 
and having to sort of assimilate to a new culture. Um, and obviously, I understand that I have a lot of privilege in uh, my migration story. Um, and so I understand that many immigrants have much uh, more complicated experiences than me. Um, but the beginning of this project came from uh, in 2019. I, uh, it was the 20th anniversary of my migration day. And it sort of like hit me. I was like, wow, OK, it's been 20 years since we like originally lived in England. And since then, I've flopped back and forth. I've gone to England for a few years, been in America for years. And uh, and so I was really reflecting on this moment and like this is kind of an important an important moment. I should be making some work about it. And at the time, I was also uh, researching place attachment, which is a um, it's it's one of those concepts that is used in lots of different fields. So it's used in psychology, it's used in uh, like city planning, and it's used in geography. And uh, so I was looking at it from the perspective of a migrant. And what are the implications of place attachment uh, for somebody who has uh, this transnational identity, somebody who has their feet in more than one land. And so how then does place play a role in that uh, formation of identity? And so um, I was reading this book, Place Attachment by uh, Paul Seaman, and uh, I found this piece that they were talking about how specific locations that people, immigrants, or just in general, have place attachment to are not places of profound significance. They're not places that, you know, you learn to ride your first bike or, you know, where you lost your first tooth. They're usually like mundane places of routine, which I was so fascinated by. And I was like thinking about places that I had place attachment to. And I was like, why is it that I don't have place attachment to, you know, some of these incredibly significant places, uh, like moments in my life? And so I was thinking back and I was like, OK, probably the most important like day and location in my life was when I moved to America. And on that day, we moved and we lived in Redmond. That day for me, on the 21st of December, 2019, we moved to Redmond, Washington. And we lived in this tiny little apartment for like six months. I was sharing like a bed with my sister. You know, it was uh, very different from the life we had been living in England. And I was thinking about that place and I was like, it's not a place of attachment for me. Like I have no um, like strong memories where I'm like, wow, like I really want to return to this place. There was no like, um, there, there was no like emotional connection to it. And so I uh, returned to that place 20 years later on exactly the same day. And I created this body of work called Immigration Day. And so here is, um, this is the first piece. So it's made up of a few different projects. So this uh, is called Rain Cyanotypes. And there are 20 cyanotypes in the series. Uh, and it is the cyanotype project or process, sorry, is uh, a historical process that has been around since the very in, like conception of photography. And it uses light sensitive um, chemicals to uh, which sort of harnesses the power of the sun to create these very vibrant blue images. Um, and what I did was I was like, I want to create a re like a, a, re a record of this specific location. I want to create, uh, you know, I'm returning after 20 years. I didn't really like remember how to get there. It was kind of like, it looked kind of similar, but there are bits of it that were different. And I was like, I want to like create a response to the space. Uh, that has such a profound uh, impact on who I am as a person um, and create sort of like a record so that, you know, 20 years from now, I can go back and be like, okay, yeah, this is what this place was to me. Uh, and so the first first thing, you know, in Washington, it's very rainy. And I, the day that I arrived uh, in, in 1999, it was raining. And then on the day that I went back, it was raining. So I was like, oh, it should be important that I document this weather. Uh, so I took the, they're just these little tiny little, um, you know, almost like baseball card size pieces of paper that were coated in the chemistry. And I just laid them out just like on the, the sidewalk and just let the rain fall directly onto the cyanotype. And so the rain comes into contact with the surface of the print and uh, washes away the, uh, the emulsion. Um, so let me show you some close-ups. 
So you can sort of see in some areas the water would begin to pool and st really start to wash away the chemistry. And then in other areas, um, you can get more of that sort of like raindrop effect where you can tell that a raindrop has landed on that piece of paper. Uh, and so for me, this was a way to record that space uh, and the weather that was happening on that day. Um, so I created 20 of these. And uh, so this one, for example, you can really see like the raindrops uh, that has really just sort of, and there are areas where it has pooled, but they create these sort of abstract representation of, um, of the weather. So this process is really um, a wonderful process that uses a cameraless uh, sort of technique. So there's no camera involved. I'm not using film. It's basically a piece of paper that's coated in chemistry. And uh, the reaction to the UV lights creates this like bright blue image. Um, it was popularized by Anna Atkins back uh, back at the very, like when photography was first being created. And uh, she was the first woman to publish a book, uh, the first woman to publish a photo book. Um, and so I wanted to, I was really inspired by this idea of like inventory and creating an archive. And so that's that's kind of what these images are attempting to do is create an inventory of this space that holds a really significant, um, a significant hold on sort of like the impact of my uh, transnational identity. So here's a few more of them, just so you can kind of see the variations, you know, like no, no two are the same. They're all individual. And the lovely thing about them is that they are very delicate and they are themselves, they are like this object. You know, I think we think of photography as being, you know, encased in a frame and it's usually, um, you know, like, has borders and whatnot. And so when, when you're working with alternative photography, you have this option to sort of, you know, think outside the box. So I'm really at the moment, I have a solo show coming up um, in November, 2024. And I'm thinking about how I'm gonna present these as, as objects um, instead of perhaps as photographs, uh, because they do have this really delicate, thin nature to them, which I wanna really emphasize. So here's a few more of them. Um, and this is just how small they are in their little archival sleeves, just, just so you can sort of get a reference. Um, and then the next part of it uh, was, I noticed that the the rain was sort of washing over like the, um, the, the parking lot. So this like black and gray sort of, um, you know, basic parking lot became like incredibly like shiny and beautiful. And there was this movement that was happening of the rain sort of moving over uh, this location. And so I was like, I kind of want to create something that re records that. And so I collected water from like the drain, just like ladling it into uh, a container. I have a picture in a second that I can show you. Um, and so I wanted to create these images that sort of use the movement. Um, and it, now that I look at them in retrospect, it reminds me of as we drove to our, that apartment on that first day and the rain sort of, you know, when you're looking out the window when you're driving in a car and the water's just sort of like going past you, it's all very traumatic. And, uh, you know, it's a like music video. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's sort of the, uh, the, the, I was attempting to sort of capture the, the movement. So, so far I've captured, you know, the weather. And in this piece, I'm capturing sort of like the motion that is happening in that space. Um, so they're all very, these ones are much larger. Um, they're, they're various different sizes, but you know, they're not like the little ones. These ones will, uh, probably be framed, um, on the wall. They're much bigger. So that was those, uh, those ones. And it's the same using cyanotype, um, and using this cameraless process, um, and interacting with the environment. Here's a picture of me collecting the water. <laughs> Um, and then I, yeah, I just I brought it home and I made those cyanotypes at um, at home, whereas the first ones I created in in situ in that location. Um, so then the next uh, the next set of images that's part of this uh, immigration project um, there. I don't know if you ever did this as a child uh, where you have like a piece of um, like newsprint and some charcoal and you uh, do like rubbings. It's called like frittage. Um, it's like a drawing method. It's a mark making method. And so I wanted to create a record of uh, the textures that I was coming into contact with of this place. So I went to all the trees, uh, you know, the side of the building, the like steps that lead down to the front door, uh, anywhere that I could get uh, 
a hold of. And I did these like charcoal drawings, um, just rubbings uh, of those and then brought them back, scanned them, turned them into digital negatives and then printed them on acetate and took them into the dark room to create contact prints. So these are printed in a color dark room. Um, and the way that I got this color was I changed the, if you're ever, if you've ever been in a color dark room, you've got like the yellow, the cyan, the magenta, and you can change the dials depending on how, what color you want to get. And so I dialed in the, the date of my immigration day. So I put uh, 12 for December, the 21st, because that was the day we moved, and then 99 for the year. And it came out with this red color, which I was like, wow, it could not have been more perfect. <laughs> uh, and so um, I wanted to talk about this like duality, this uh, becoming an immigrant, you have this, um, you know, you, you become kind of two people, you know, like the person you were before you immigrated. Uh, I was a Brit, I was a child, I was living in England, I had a very different life. And then I moved to America and then I all of a sudden became an immigrant and became someone who, uh, you know, had uh, sort of this, I wouldn't say, um, it's kind of just a, a different experience, you know, to, you know, being away from your family, being away from home, uh, having to assimilate into a new culture, learn new ways of speaking, new ways of being. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that duality. So I've created, this isn't all of them. I haven't uh, got a digital image of all of them because they're analog prints, um, but there are 40 in the series. So there are 20 red ones and 20 black ones. So keeping with that same theme of the 20 images uh, for the 20 years that it had been since I had been uh, moved to America. Uh, so there, um, the, the images are created. They're just eight by 10 and they are, um, let me give you a close up of some of them. Here's some of them in an exhibition that I had uh, a few years back. Um, so they're really quite, you know, like they are, you, they look like drawings. They look like um, these, like the trees, like this one's obviously from a tree, but it's a photograph. You know, I'm using a contact print in the, in the dark room to create these photographic images. Um, and they are, you know, the, the dark room uh, paper and they're just mounted onto dye bond. Um, so they're very, they have that objectness to them as well, which I really love. Um, so here's a few more. And so this one is obviously uh, like from like a fire hydrant or something, you know, like uh, the the objects that are sort of in an a, an apartment complex. They're super vivid. Yeah, and I think the the nature of the Fertage drawings are kind of one of those things that um, that when you first see them on the paper, you know, they're kind of rough and they're um, you know they are stark like charcoal black with the white of the newsprint paper. So then when you turn them into a photograph, uh, they they keep that contrast uh, and you still get that texture, which is really wonderful. Um, and I had to do a lot of experimentation with different acetates that I was printing onto um, because some of them uh, didn't come out quite so clearly, and some of them you like you'd have to double up because of like the thickness of the ink that was laying on the acetate. So there's a bit of experimentation with how the the digital negs were created, um, but they really sort of give an energy and uh, showcase the various textures of um, of the place that I lived for the first six months when I moved to America. Um, so here's a few more. So that's sort of the, the first project. That one is deeply personal. That one's all about my immigration story and I'm still sort of working on it. Um, I'm sort of figuring out how I want to uh, present it in, uh, in an exhibition space. Um, it's lots of little works that will amount to bigger things. So it's kind of figuring out how to do that in the most successful way. And I also collected letters from each of uh, my family members um, recounting the memories of that day. So it's really interesting to look at those letters and see how we all remember that day in different different ways. Uh, there are key things that came through in all of our letters. So we all remembered that like our bunny rabbit got left behind, like it didn't get on the get put on the airplane. Oh my so, God. <laughs> so we all remembered stuff like that. But then like my, my little brother, he remembered, um, he remembered like the big truck that came and packed up all our furniture, whereas that was not something I remembered. And my dad was like really super specific. Like he was like, at 930, we did this. At 945, we left for the airport. At this time, What did you we... remember? I remembered a lot more like sort of um, 
like the emotional side of it, I think. So mm. I was like, I remember, um, you know, like saying goodbye to our neighbors. They all came to the front door and like waved goodbye to us as we drove away. And I remember sort of that feeling of like uncertainty and um, kind of like the unknown. So it, mine was more like an, the emotions that I remembered, whereas like my dad was very fact driven. It was very much like, OK, we, we woke up at this time. We left at this time. Uh, we got on the airplane, we took a left here, we took a right here, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting to see the different um, the different memories and like how memory can change over time and how you can lose memory um, and how, you know, like I think the, the rabbit was lose, uh, leaving the rabbit behind came through in all of our stories because we've told that story so many times like that has become a part of our migration story when we tell it to other people you know yeah it's so interesting isn't it but about memory that the more you like, i guess when you have a certain memory the more you recount that memory yeah it's almost as if you um you, things that weren't there appear or it's sort of like a you know so the fact that you guys kept remembering this certain memory. I mean, maybe the bunny was there, but now it's part of all, of, <laughs> now it's part of all your memory. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. I think the the bunny rabbit was, um, it ended up being quite an evil bunny rabbit that liked to scratch us. And uh, it became kind of like a, a joke in our this bunny rabbit that was just maybe traumatized by being left behind. I'm not sure, but it was not a very nice bunny rabbit. <laughs> but anyways, so that project was very much about sort of my own individual experience of migration and this idea of sort of realizing that I did not have any place attachment to this place that should have been a really significant place in in my life and in the formation of my transnational identity and realizing that actually it kind of means nothing to me. <laughs> so by going back and creating these images, it was sort of like I was forcing myself to like rethink about that time and think about those memories and, you know, Put myself in that situation. So with the homesick project, uh, this one is kind of uh, dealing with similar themes. It's dealing with migration. It's dealing with uh, this, you know, back and forth, this transnational identity. Um, but this one is, I was working with 10 migrant women. So I started, um, at the time I was working for an online uh, creative community created by Natasha Caruana, who's an artist in England. Um, called Work Show Grow. And I was working for her and it was during the middle of the pandemic. And uh, in, in the UK, the pandemic restrictions were, you know, like you could only leave your house for like one hour a day for exercise. And um, I lived alone at that time. So I was incredibly, you know, like just really scared. Didn't know when I was gonna see my family again. I didn't know if they were safe or if they were gonna be sick. And there was, you know, I was talking with them on Zoom and talking with them on my phone and, you know, hearing horror stories of, you know, people that had died and people that were getting really, really sick from the pandemic. And so I started feeling really homesick for America, which is something I'd never experienced before. And I'd always felt homesick for England, you know, living in America, I'd sort of idealized this place in England in my head, like, oh, it was this magnificent place uh, when I was a child. And, you know, you watch all those like rom-coms, like Love Actually and, you, and Harry Potter, and you start to like fictionalize what England really actually is. And then when I moved back, I was like, oh, actually, England's not like that really. <laughs> and then uh, when I was like feeling like, homesick for America and for my family. It was really conflicting. I was like, this is weird. Like, why do I feel this way for America? And so I put a message on the Work Show Grow, um, like Slack message board. And I was like, hey, I'm just, I'm feeling really like confused and conflicted. I don't know if any immigrants have felt this way at all because uh, the Work Show Grow community is super international. It's got lots of different people from all over the world. So, um, I just, I don't know, I think I was just sort of seeking some reassurance <laughs> that it was all going to be okay. And I woke up the next morning inundated with like 40 different messages from people who were telling me their stories of how they were trapped in whatever country they were trapped in and couldn't make it back um, to their homes and how some of them, you know, like their moms were, you know, who had cancer and they were really worried that they couldn't get the treatment they needed and they couldn't be there to help them. So all these different stories started to, you know, appear. And we started having conversations about like, what is homesickness? 
And I think homesickness kind of has this um, stereotype that it's like, you know, the kid that goes to summer camp and they're like missing their family and they're feeling a little bit homesick. But actually homesickness is a, a mental health condition that can have physical symptoms as well as uh, sort of more emotional symptoms. Uh, and so some of the people I was speaking to were having like gut issues and were like grinding their teeth and, um, you know, like uh, in some cases, you know, it can it can cause like a lot of like physical issues that um, are really quite distressing. So anyways, I decided to uh, turn those conversations I was having into a project. And uh, they were all very wonderful, lovely people who I had, you know, got to know through Work Show Grow. So it, it was kind of, you know, like a collaboration uh, more than sort of like a project. But I asked each of them to, um, provide a list of liquids or um, drinks that reminded them of home. Because a lot of these conversations where people were like, gosh, you know, like it's been two years since I've had like a really good cup of coffee, you know, like but the coffee here is not nearly as good as the coffee at home kind of kind of stories. And a lot of them had to do with food and drinks from when, you know, things that, you know, maybe their mom used to make for them when they were feeling sick or maybe it was, you know, like their favorite restaurant they used to go to with their friends. And so um, I collected this list. Uh, these are the 10 participants. These are the countries that they consider home. Uh, the, li the liquid that they each provided for me. And then I took a roll of 35 millimeter Kodak film and soaked it in uh, whichever liquid they provided. So for Mimi, it was a Pisco Sour. And I soaked it in that liquid for one hour for every day that it had been since they had returned home. So for some people, it was years that they had been home, you know, like they hadn't been prior to the pandemic. And now that all the borders had closed, they also weren't able to return home. So, um, you know, some of them were like 1,078 hours that they were, they were soaking. And so I had these containers uh, sitting on my counter. I wonder if I have a photo, I do. So yeah, so I had these um, these containers with the 35 millimeter roll of film sitting uh, like on my kitchen counter for months. Like they were just sitting there, some of them not so long, but some of them, you know, because it had been so long since they had returned home, they were sitting there and they started to grow mold and they started to like really smell and uh, like the kefir like uh, solidified. Like, so here's a picture of that. So it got really like, I was not expecting it to get this gruesome. It was not my intent that it would get uh, moldy and gross. Um, so yeah, I had these like sitting on my counter. And uh, so then eventually once the, the time had come to an end, I would clean the film. And then uh, obviously you can't send this film into a lab because it can break the equipment. So I had to hand uh, process the film, which I really enjoy doing so it, it was good and then I, it came up with these crazy wild images and it was really um kind of shocking at first because you never know what you're going to get with the film soup process uh this process is um another alternative process that is used kind of it's a uh, more experimental uh not so popularly used as cyanotype i think cyanotype has become like lots of people are using it and the film soup one is kind of you know starting to get used more but it's a process that you have zero control over. <laughs> so you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what colors you're going to get. You don't know what like um, the levels of deterioration. So like some of them were where the liquid had been like hot. So the ones that were like chicken broth or um, like hot tea, the plastic had like warped and like changed shape. Um, and then some of them like a chemical reaction had occurred where the emulsion was interacting with, uh, you know, like the liquid. And so the emulsion started to break apart and like flake off. So there were some rolls of film that were completely like just broken to pieces and like were frail. And there were some that had like were perfectly fine, you know? <laughs> Interestingly, the root beer, which I thought I was like, oh, that's a soda that will have like quite an impact. It didn't really have that much impact at all, which I, it was more like the mint tea that one had a real impact. And uh, I think like um, the chicken broth did. So they came up with these kind of these crazy images, really abstract. And so these images 
this project is much more about the process. It's not so much about um, like these images aren't meant to represent anything. This is the outcome of the process. So the art itself is the making. It is the creative process. It is the having those conversations with the uh, the women. It is uh, talking about homesickness. It is the soaking the film, the processing, the printing. And so the final the final image is kind of a conclusion. Like this is what has occurred from doing this project. Um, so they are these abstract, really wild colors, and they all, you know, they're all very different, which was wonderful. So they're so beautiful. Yeah, they are. They're really fun, and I'm printing them um, on aluminum, and they're like super glossy, and they're really big, and they look just. I think I've got an image uh, of them in an exhibition right here. So they wow. like when you see them in person, they're like really, really shiny. So you can like see your own reflection in them. Um, and that kind of just makes them these weird, shiny objects. Uh, so this was a, an exhibition I just recently had. Uh, I was selected for 40 women under 40 um, who were uh, in, in, in the arts. So these two uh, were on exhibition and it was really great because uh, it's I was making this project about homesickness and uh, I got to exhibit it in America and all my family got to come and see it, which was really wonderful. So it was sort of like a nice little end to that project. Um, but in addition to these abstract images, I also asked them to write uh, a piece about, um, about their feelings of homesickness. So I was like, it can be whatever you want. It can be a diary entry. It can be a poem. It can be, you know, just a little like note, whatever you want, just like, I'd like to understand like your perspective of homesickness. And so I wanted to share this poem with you that was written by Mimi who um, has written, she's um, currently living or, when I was doing this project, she was living in LA. Um, and so she wrote this poem about her experience of homesickness. I'm just gonna read it for you right now. Um, she says, we have begun our descent. There's something profound I feel as I anticipate the arrival in this land of mine. Who would call it my land when it's been years that I've been without her? I long to breathe the Chilean air, mountain range in hand, the long awaited encounters, friends to surprise, grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews. I feel my heart palpitating as I await in anticipation. Anticipation I didn't think was there. I've underestimated, underestimated my attachment, my ties, but here they are waiting to touch the soil at last. So I think that's just like a really beautiful um, sort of representation of this experience of homesickness. Um, and so I wanted to share some of these with you as well. And they were all very different. So this one was on like a little like note card. So like this is like the front of the card and this is the back of the card and this is what was written inside. Um, and so this is the artwork that uh, of Roxana. She, she's an artist as well. So all the people I interviewed are artists as well. They're all photographers. Um, and so this is one of her pieces that she is making about migration and about her experience of um, you know, sort of being an immigrant living abroad. Uh, and this one is Roxana, or sorry, this one is Na Noemi, Noemi, who is uh, living between France and America, um, but she has other places around the globe that also she considers home. So this is one of her art pieces as well. So I'm in the exhibition, I will have each of these on display in sort of like desk cases so people can read them and see the physical um, letters that have been written. Um, so yeah, that was the, the Homesick Project. And then I was just going to talk a little bit about Women Alternative Photography Group, uh, just real quick, which is um, a new sort of research project that I started this year, only a couple months ago. It's just a, it's just a baby organization right now. It's just starting out. And um, I basically I've just uh, moved back to America. So I'm back in Seattle now. And um, I was kind of Throughout my PhD, I've been doing interviews with uh, migrant women talking about alternative photography. And it came through in many of these discussions that there's lots of like how to books, you know, like how to make a cyanotype, how to make an anthotype, uh, but not a lot of like critical analysis on uh, work that is being done uh, in, in alternative photography and not a ton on sort of like the theoretical side of, the, of these processes. And so I really wanted to just sort of, you know, have a have a space to champion the work that is being done, champion the work of women who are using these processes, um, and but also have a platform to um, like create a space for this research to be done. So 
Women Alternative Photography Group, it's a research project. It celebrates underrepresented communities from all backgrounds working with alternative photographic processes. Um, so our mission is uh, primarily to sort of uh, distribute new knowledge um, on women who are using these innovative and experimental processes, as well as historical techniques that are currently being reinvigorated and reinvented. So a lot of these processes um, are they're historical. They've been used for you know many many years, um, and so now in this uh, you know 2023, we're starting to use them in very different ways. We're starting to um, create more sustainable approaches to uh, photography, so we have lower impact on the environment, and uh, we're we're kind of coming up with new processes as well. So. Um, some of those processes, you know, like we've mentioned already, cyan type film soup, lumen prints, um, all of these different processes. But, you know, these are just a selection. There's so many more, which is kind of the wonderful thing about alternative photography is that there's, you know, there's an endless supply of different processes that you can use. And some will work for some projects, some won't work, uh, but they're they're really fun to explore. Um, and so uh, alongside the this project, I've been doing monthly interviews. Um, talking to women who are using these processes and really trying to like dig deeper to find out like why it is that they use these processes and how they're using these processes to discuss and uh you know talk about the these really important concepts so um this is one that i the very first one that came out um a couple of months ago with liz harrington who is investigating uh coastal beaches in the uk and she's using the cyanotype process um so our next one is coming out on the 25th of May, and that one is going to be looking at artists who are using photogravure process. Um, so it's going to, I'm gonna have sort of these various different interview series um, about different processes, uh, hopefully build a big catalog of interviews that people can come to learn about these processes and why they're being used and how they're being used. Um, along with that, I also wanted to um, run workshops one, I just really love running workshops. They're super fun to meet new people and to sort of see uh, them experience the magic of these processes for the first time, which is really fun. But also um, one of the biggest outcomes that we learned from writing the report that um, Fast Forward just published uh, was that you know, not everyone has access to uh, photography education. Um, I think higher education, in many countries is incredibly expensive and inaccessible. Um, so financially it's not necessarily accessible, but for people who are caregivers, for people who are mothers, uh, you know, people with learning difficulties, uh, you know, higher education is not gonna be a space that is gonna be very inviting. Uh, and a lot of people just can't do it. Uh, and so I think it's really important that we have um, workshops that people can access no matter what their background or their socioeconomic sort of standing. Uh, so that people can, you know, learn about these wonderful processes and learn about the, the people that are using them. Uh, and so I'm doing a series of workshops over the summer and I'm hoping to do some online that are free that people can join from all over the world. Um, I'm sort of in the process of planning that, so it hasn't been announced yet. <laughs> And then obviously we have a resource page. Uh, so if anyone uh, knows of any uh, women who are writing about alternative processes or about those theories surrounding them, like we'd like to create this page where you, know, you can just click on a link and you can access super easily uh, these resources that um, you know, might be a bit difficult to find traditionally. Um, so yeah. You can get involved by following us on Instagram, joining our newsletter, or participating in one of the events. Um, and hopefully, uh, the as we grow and get bigger, uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to apply for some grants and get some funding so we can do much bigger projects. Um, but right now, it is primarily sort of these workshops and the interview series and sort of holding quarterly meetings to bring people together to discuss these processes. And I think that is it. So much. Um, that was incredible. Um, I just want to remind the audience that um, we do have the chat box, and so if you have any questions, please um, pop them in the chat box and you know, for Elizabeth to answer. Uh, we only have around, I think, 15 to 20 minutes. There are some things I really want to ask you. Um, I want to go back to your uh, projects, uh, Immigration Day and um, Homesick. Um, I see that they're both a work in progress. Um, 
and you know besides the visual there's the the temporal or, or an element of time you know with immigration day you have that fixed date um and with homesick you play with the length of time in kind of you know the process or the processes um since there's this there is this element of time do you see it stopping ever or evolving or do you see these projects eventually coming to an end or you know what yeah i think uh, that's a great question i think with the immigration day um there i think will be a stopping point where this iteration of it will end i think once i have um finalized like the presentation i'm kind of like in that research stage where i'm kind of figuring out like how i want to present it in an exhibition um, i've done many exhibitions of the work but not as a whole as a whole project as one so i think for me it will that part of it will come to an end probably uh once i've figured that out once i've kind of finalize that in my mind, but not to say that I wouldn't, won't return to it. I kind of, when I was first thinking of the project, I thought it'd be cool to come back 10 years later, 20 years later, and do a similar thing to kind of document any of the changes that are happening in that space um, uh, and creates an impression of that location throughout, you know, my lifetime. So it's, I might continue making it, I haven't officially decided yet, um, but it'd be kind of cool to see how it changes over time. Um, Surprisingly, it hadn't changed that much in the 20 years that I've lived here. Like it was, it's owned by someone else now. And I think they put up a few fences, but like other than that, it looked pretty much looked the same. And with the homesick one, uh, that one will definitely have an end point. I mean, that one could continue for ages. You know, I could have, you know, like there are so many women that have these stories. There are so many people that are experiencing homesickness. And I think particularly during the pandemic, it was exacerbated. Uh, and so I think I could, do endless amounts of these images and um, you know thousands of them and tell all these different stories. But I think it's nice to kind of keep it concise uh, and to talk about that particular time of which we were, you know, really we were stuck and we couldn't move because of the pandemic. I think that's a really yeah. unique time in history that hasn't really occurred before. So um, I think that one will definitely have an end point to it once, once uh, I have an exhibition, a solo exhibition of it. Um, just to kind of get the, uh, you know, touch upon homesick for, for a bit. It's obviously a collaborative project that is so deeply personal and, and, and relatable. And I was thinking of smell and how smell can trigger like vivid memories. Um, were the women involved in the in-between bit? So, you know, when there was like mold growing and, and all of that, were they, were they involved in that? Did they experience that? Um, I wonder how, you know, if, you know, because smell also triggers memories. But um, to add to that, um, I just wonder how cathartic it was for the women to see like a physical manifestation of, of how they uh, how they've been feeling or how they felt um, for for a long time. Yeah. So sadly, because we were stuck in the middle of the pandemic, I was you know locked inside my house making this work. Oh. <laughs> so sadly, they didn't get to see the mold growing and they didn't get to smell the really gross smells. Um, however, I was communicating with many of them throughout the process. Some of them told me upfront, you know, like, okay, yeah, I've provided you with the story, but I don't want to, you know, really get too much more involved. Uh, and then some people I was communicating, like texting throughout the process being like, hey, look, this is what your image looks like. And a few of them were like, wow, like this is wild that you have created an image that accurately kind of showcases these like mixed up, distressing in, like experience yeah. in, an, in an image. Cause a lot of them are, you know, quite like the, the negatives become really broken down and distorted sort of reflecting that experience of, you know, feeling like lost and uh, like, you know, like trapped and like you can't escape. So yeah, for some of them, um, I think it was possibly quite cathartic to see the images. Um, and then some of them very much just were like, I'm happy to just give you my story and then do whatever you want to do with it <laughs> and they um yeah. and 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 that's that's absolutely fine i didn't want to have any control over that i didn't want to be like you must participate <laughs> you know i wanted it to be quite open so yeah i think it was quite fluid depending on who it was and um speaking of outcome um immigration day were you surprised by the way the images turned out like the the reds and and the blacks and that very because i know you played with the dial when that image came up on the screen, 
or when it was printed. How shocked were you at the reds and the blacks? Yeah, I mean, I was, I'd never done that process before. It was the first, I mean, I've made photograms before in the black and white darkroom, but I've never done it with color before. So it was a new process for me. And it did take a lot of testing and a lot of working with um, the technicians at UCA to figure out how to get that acetate, um, that digital neg to work correctly. But the moment that I got that red, it's quite an angry red. It's yeah. not It's not like a peaceful red. <laughs> and then the blues that are coming from the, the cyanotypes are very like, you know, they have connotations of sadness to them. Mm. And so I think the color is really a significant part of that project because my immigration day, I did not want to move to America. Like yeah. I did, when I got here, I was like, you know, people, we were learning about uh, the Revolutionary War. And so for some reason, they thought that me as a nine-year-old um, uh, killed all their ancestors in the Revolutionary War. And so they oh, were not okay. very kind about it. Uh, and so I, I did not like that I had an accent. I didn't like that I was different. And I didn't like that uh, people made fun of me like so much when I first moved here. So that I was really angry about that having to move here and really sad that I had to leave behind my family and friends. And so, I mean, it wasn't intentional. I think it's sort of like a happy accident that it just happened to come out that color. But I think with the processes that I'm using, it's no matter what color I got, I probably would have kept it, you know, like if I had got like hot pink or something, I would have gone with it because it's much more about the concept of using the dials to dial in that uh, that date because the date is so significant yeah. to that project. Um, it just happened to be that it was red. So I was like, yeah. wow, that works perfect. It's an angry red as well. Yeah. It's yeah. so interesting. Um, I want us to kind of pivot towards Women Alternative Photography Group um, and talk accessibility for a second. Um, I know that you mentioned the great interview series that you currently have, and you mentioned the, the interview series with Liz Harrington. Um, and there's a quote where she says, I had no easy access to a dark room and it was not possible to set up a safe, usable space in my studio. So this constraint meant that I had to look to alternatives. So I was just wondering in the context of, let's say Qatar or the region, what would your advice be to people who are interested in kind of pursuing alternative photography practices? I know you said you're looking to do workshops online at some point. Um, but if you were living here and you were interested in cyanotype printing or, um, you know, different alternative photography practices, what would what would you recommend? Yeah, I think that's a great question because dark rooms are becoming less and less and the dark rooms that are available aren't accessible as far as there are a few of them. You might have to travel to them. Um, they're quite expensive sometimes. And so a lot of these alternative processes are able to be done at home, which is really wonderful. Um, I would suggest starting out with one of the processes that can be done really easily from your home. And I would, I mean, I just love anthotypes. So I would 100% suggest like looking into anthotypes because you don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need any fancy chemistry. You just need vegetables and sunlight, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, like, Exactly. So mm -hmm. you can just go to, you know, if you grow your own vegetables even better, or if you're able to access um, like a beetroot or um, cabbage or berries or flowers, you can do it with flowers as well. You can um, use like petals from a rose or like sweet peas, and you can use uh, these vegetables and plants to create an emulsion. Uh, so it's a, it's a process where you, um, you, you basically can use like a mortar and pestle and you can like grind it uh, and then like get the juice come out of it um, and then use that juice to paint the emulsion onto just, you know, like it can be really on any absorbent surface, but I've found that it works best with like watercolor paper or like mixed media paper. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, you can lay objects on top of it, like a plant, or if you happen to have a, a, a negative, you can use a negative. And then you just expose that to light and you get a photograph. So there are some really fun processes that you can do at home that you don't need anything expensive or anything fancy. And I would, I mean, anthotype, I think is probably, or chlorophyll printing, where you're directly printing onto a plant. I think those two 
are probably the most accessible alternative processes that mm. aren't going to use anything harmful. They're not gonna, like if you've got kids at home or if you've got pets, they're not gonna get harmed by these processes and they are really cheap and easy and fun. Cool. Is there a, a book or a video that you would recommend um, for people to kind of reference? Yeah, so there's lots of, um, if you go to the, uh, first of all, London Alternative Photography Collective have, uh, they're run by Melanie King and um, Hannah Fletcher and I think a few other people, but they have done, they've created a, a, a series of videos where you can learn these processes. So I think it's either London Alternative Photography Collective or if you just go to Melanie King's website, uh, they have some really wonderful uh, videos that they have made uh, if you are able to do, um, if you learn best by using video or there, there are books, there's an anthotype book. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the author, um, but I can, I can send you the resources if, if you would like. Um, but it's it also, if you just sort of Google alternative processes, uh, there's a, a number of websites that are kind of popping up now where people are really starting to get excited about these processes uh, and start like there's a new school that's a, that's about to start or has already started where you can learn them. Um, yeah, so there, there's, there are resources out there on the how to make them. Um, and yeah, I would definitely recommend London Alternative Photography Collective. They, they've got some good resources out there. Cool, very cool. Um, I see we've got a couple of questions. Um, I think we've got five to 10 minutes. Um, so there's a question from Haga El Hadi. Um, can I know which kind of paper or mediums you print on? Yeah, so for the cyanotypes, the, the blue ones, I'm using a watercolor paper. Um, I just got like a really big um, pad that you can get from any like your regular art store. Um, and it was just, yeah, a big, a big paper, a big paper pad of watercolor paper for the um, red and black ones those ones are printed on um fuji film crystal light uh darkroom color darkroom paper um i think it's like 10 by 12 inch um that one's a little bit harder to get access to and and you would need a color darkroom to use those um but those are the two papers for that one for the uh, homesick project, there is no paper at all. Uh, I'm using just the, the negatives and uh, printing digitally onto aluminum. So no paper on that one, but yeah. Cool, we have another question. What has been your most memorable response to your work? And that's from Melissa Thomas. Um, most memorable response. I think for me, uh, during the pandemic, I first showed the rain cyanotypes in um, an exhibition in Folkestone. And it was an in-progress exhibition with the rest of my, or just like two or three of my um, PhD students, the, my friends, and we put on this exhibition. And it was the first time during the pandemic that things started to open up and people were able to you know, we had lots of restrictions. Everyone had to wear a mask. Everyone had to hand sanit had, have hand sanitizer on. And there was like, you know, you had to be like one meter away from everyone. So it was a really interesting exhibition experience because it was much different than you would normally have. Um, and this little kid came in and saw the rain cyanotypes. And at this point I was experimenting with like blowing them up big and printing them really large digitally. And he saw the one of the, the cyanotypes and for him, because, you know, a lot of his life, he had been trapped inside in a pandemic. He thought that it was the coronavirus mm. and he saw it as, uh, you know, like these cells. So I was like, that's yeah. so fascinating to me because that was you know, not my intention at all. I had no, yeah. but just the context of the situation that we were living in, people sort of saw like these amoeba scientific sort of like shapes mm -hmm. uh, rather than what rain. On the news. Yeah. Yeah. Was he shocked or was it like a, like, a, oh, COVID or, you know, or was it like, a, oh my God, it's COVID crying. It was not crying, so thankfully. Okay. <laughs> it was definitely more <laughs> of like an interest, you know, like, whoa, what's that? Mm -hmm. That's like, because I think a lot of these processes, people have never seen photography like that before. So it's very new yeah. and they're like, what is this? This is wild. Um, and so for, for him, it was more of like an intrigue rather than like, a, mm. oh my God, COVID. <laughs> oh my God, COVID. <laughs> That's so, so interesting. I actually have one last question for you. Um, mm. 
obviously you were involved with Taswir um, last time we had a festival, which was during COVID, peak COVID. Um, and, um, you know, via the Fast Forward Women in Photography Workshop. So I wonder from then to now, you know, kind of seeing this change and, and I guess progress, what advice, I guess, would you offer for future editions of the suite, you know, as, as, a, as someone who puts on workshops, as the founder of Women's Alternative Photography Group, um, what, would you, what would you say or, or offer as advice? Yeah, I mean, I think it's wonderful what you got, what you have done already, and um, to see sort of that transition from where where we were when we were doing the fast forward workshop to where it is now, it's great to see you know people actually out in person looking at the exhibitions now and having that in person experience, which I think is really great. Um, I think from a very biased perspective, I would say you know advocate for alternative processes, you know, have yeah. exhibit, exhibit work by uh, women who are using these processes. Um, I mean, I think that would be like phenomenal. It is one of those things in the art marketplace. Uh, there, are, there are definitely artists that are using these uh, processes and they, they do get shown, but it's kind of like on the peripheries sometimes, you know, it's not mm. always like the, uh, it's kind of like a, the weird, like alternative piece that gets shown. And then, you know, it's sort of your, lots of other stuff. So I'd say, yeah, do some more alternative photography. Yeah. But also I think as far as one of the things that we discussed a lot uh, at Fast Forward uh, during um, a workshop that we had and during the writing of the um, report was making festivals uh, accessible to people who have disabilities and people who perhaps are uh, neurodivergent or neurodiverse or, um, or people that are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds that can't access um, you know, they can't either travel to festivals, they can't, you know, they wouldn't be able to go onto like the train or they don't have the funding to go. So one way that was sort of um, shown to us by Shawer Mavlin, who is um, now the director of the Photographer's Gallery, but at the time she was working at PhotoWorks and they had just done a PhotoWorks festival in a box, and which, box was, yeah. which was really fun. And so that was just sort of like a new way of making festivals accessible to people that maybe can't travel and um, can't access those spaces for whatever reason. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, more alternative photography, I, love, I think, and some I love accessibility. That. Yeah, 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 and I love the fact that Festival on the Box actually really, really good point in accessibility from different uh, perspectives, you know. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. No, thank you. This evening. It's been so great hearing from you and learning more about um, your work and alternative photography practices and women um, alternative photography group as well. Um, thank you all for joining us. You can find Elizabeth and women's alternative photography group on Instagram. Um, I'd just like to remind our viewers in Qatar that the visit exhibitions are running until the 20th. So if you haven't checked them out, please do. Uh, please join us again tomorrow for a conversation with the founder of Amsterdam's Hammer Gallery, Nina Hammer. Um, yeah, and we've got more conversations coming this week. Elizabeth, thank you so, so much. It's been a thank you. Pleasure.